It is six o'clock, which means it's time for the panel. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, Everyone here in uh, Panels 1 and also at home on uh, twitch.tv slash magfest underscore Panels 1. Getting good at that. Uh, I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Kelsey Lewin. Uh, and we run a nonprofit organization called the Video Game History Foundation that really kind of needs to work on its elevator pitch a little bit. It's a little awkward still. But uh, basically, we want to make sure that people have what they need to actually tell the story of video games, because we just kind of think the tools are lacking a little bit right now. But we'll get into that uh, in a minute. I want to give a little bit of a backstory. So this panel is about uh, the last three years of the organization, but really the preservation story uh, for me personally goes back um, quite a bit longer than that. Um, so I've been preserving video game history in one form or another for, uh, I believe this is, uh, well, we've just entered my 21st year, which is horrifying. Um, <laughs> it's not an anniversary. Only the 20 years gets a clap, not 21. Uh, it, it can You're, drink it can now. It can drink now, yeah. exactly. Uh, <laughs> my career can drink now. Um, so uh, my career goes back to basically to, to when I first got access to the internet and discovered this uh, very magic technology at the time in 1999 called uh, software emulation. Uh, I was really uh, just baffled and impressed by the, the idea that you could download like cartridge games and make them run on your computer. And I got really interested in uh, finding out where the, the ROM files, the actual files that, that came from the cartridges, where those came from. And um, that got me kind of deeper and deeper into the obscure back catalogs of older consoles. And I ended up involving myself um, in uh, uh, documenting and preserving digitally cartridge games that sort of fell between the cracks, like like the stuff we're about to play at midnight tonight at whatever room that is, bootleg games pajama party. Um, so that actually, so uh, actually, the, let me go back to this previous slide. Um, doing that, uh, I kind of got serious about it. I was like, wait, this isn't just a hobby. Like, there's there's actually things we're losing. Uh, so I started a website called Lost Levels. Uh, this is me at Classic Gaming Expo 2003 with our Lost Levels booth. Um, I still have that vinyl banner somewhere. Um, and uh, Lost Levels was the first website on the internet that uh, said, hey, what about the games that didn't come out? Let's talk about those. Uh, because it turns out a lot of those games that didn't get to stores were actually, you know, not necessarily great in a lot of cases, but were at least interesting and in a lot of times were even done. Um, and uh, so in addition to digitizing the game, uh, I started actually talking to the people who made them, writing up articles and stuff. And that led me stumbling into the video game industry. Um, I started uh, reviewing games for Nintendo Official Magazine UK. Uh, I uh, was an editor at uh, Gama Sutra and 1UP and uh, eventually uh, got into um, game development at a studio called Other Ocean. Uh, and, and our sub-label Digital Eclipse, I, I uh, produced a few um, classic game compilations uh, like Mega Man Legacy Collection and SNK 40th. Uh, thank you to the one person clapping. Um, <laughs> so um, throughout you know, my career as a journalist, I, I kind of realized our, our tools for studying video game history sucked and in fact our, our record of video game history kind of sucked. Um, this is just one example that I published uh, when I worked at Gama Sutra, which is that I can't substantiate the release date of Super Mario Brothers in the U.S. There's just no paper trail saying this is the day that Super Mario Brothers, you know, graced our lands and saved the video game industry or whatever. We don't have that date. We have what we believe to be the date, but we can't substantiate it, and that kind of sucks. Um, and it's it's not just that like the tools that are out there are bad. I mean, in 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 my career as a developer, I I, I kind of realized that like you can't really trust company archives either. Uh, having worked with studios like uh, Capcom and SNK, uh, there there are archives, but they're kind of lacking. They're not really you know uh, what we would need to to uh, truly record what that company was and what their output was. The example up here uh, was when I was working on SNK 40th Anniversary Collection, which was a collection of the, that company's earliest games, we couldn't get their earliest game. The first SNK game called Micon Block is, is, is uh, pictured here in these like weird almost like Sasquatch photos that you can barely make out the, the contents for and it's like no one who no one who works at SNK was there at the time. No, no, none of the like arcade museums or whatever in Japan have this game. Like we just can't find it anymore, and SNK certainly didn't have it either. Um, so I, I started the Video Game History Foundation uh, a little over three years ago, a little under three years ago, I guess. Um, 
And um, you know, I had always had this idea in my head of, of, of uh, forming a nonprofit and, and growing the kind of thing that I do beyond me. Um, but uh, a little more than that, though, I think what what in my head was needed most was uh, people in the industry who had the kind of material that needed to be put away somewhere so that people could study it. Uh, I, I needed a stronger story than I know this guy Frank. You know, I needed like a name attached to it, and I needed 501c3 status to be like, no, we're you know we're the adults here. Like, talk to us, we'll figure this out. Um, so we launched a. Uh, Patreon campaign, um, patreon.com slash game history org, um, and our website, and we actually launched, uh, IGN was very kind on launch day to uh, host, I, I believe, an eight hour, uh, like, telethon with, uh, with us, which is really cool, uh, which is where Kelsey comes in. Yeah, so I was pretty much just a, the, exactly that, I was a frustrated historian who also knew that the tools out there sucked. Um, I was doing a lot of research, and while I enjoy my research, it was very difficult and um, oftentimes led to dead ends, and uh, I knew that the materials I wanted to see were out there somewhere that just weren't accessible. So I heard about this Video Game History Foundation launching, and I wanted to get involved someday, because I, or somehow, because I really wanted to, uh, I wanted this to exist. I wanted this to actually get easier. And I knew how to do PR. I had a degree in communications, and I'm like, well, you know what I can do is I can just start throwing labor at this. Maybe I'll help it grow. Um, so what I did was I sent this long message to Frank, and don't I was do like, this. Yeah, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, I'll do some PR for free for you. And uh, he we'll just, do that part. But. Yeah, he just kind of blew me off. I, I, that's true. Yeah, it was and like, uh, yeah, thanks. That's I think, nice, I think that's but the I, right call. I, I got it covered. You don't, but you don't know me. Feel free it's to fine. give us money anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but she she now. didn't go away. Um, so uh, Kelsey was like, "All right, well, if you're not gonna like accept my help there, you're, I'm just gonna be up in your business." I'm just gonna keep showing up. So I became a $25 a month patron, uh, which you can do to basically have access to us once a month. Um, we kind of give like a recap of what's going on, and you can talk to us and and all of that good stuff. So I just kind of kept showing up to all of those meetings and saying things that I guess were smart enough to <laughs> make you. Realize I'm not just some person. Well, you had a lot of really good ideas, um, <laughs> and and you came to the meeting like, you know, prepared with ideas that that um, I hadn't thought of before. And like when I would sort of express, you know, what was going on with us, I I I, I felt that you um, considered them appropriately and had good responses and and good counter uh, points to them. So um, anyway, Kelsey stuck around, uh, kept volunteering. Um, you did the very, very crazy volunteer thing, which is you accompanied me for five weeks to an archiving expedition in May of last year. <laughs> All five weeks. I'm sorry, Cody. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, uh, you know, you, Kelsey just had been around so long and, and had been helping so much that it's just like, you know, hey, you want to you want to make this official, you know? Um, so we kind of we kind of had a, a dinner one night where it was like, it was almost like a where do you see yourself in five years? But not really because I'm not lame. Um, <laughs> But it's basically like, where are we going with this? What, what do you want? And Kelsey's like, well, I, I want, okay, fine. I, I want to be employee number three, I think is what you said. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> and I was like, well, you just want to be my equal instead because I don't want to be your boss. Because that <laughs> sounds lame. Um, so she said yes. So Kelsey became the co-founder of the, the foundation uh, earlier this year. Director. Co-director. I, I did not go back in time. And, and co yeah, you were not the co-founder. You're right. The co-director of the Video Game History Foundation. And um, suddenly our staff doubled and we were off to the races. Um, ooh, that is very slow animation. Wow. That is not... <laughs> kind of accurate, though. <laughs> that is true. That is us off to the races. Um, Wow, it doesn't want to go to the next slide. Okay. Is that actually the next slide? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, I get this, this panel, um, I wanted it to be a reflection of the last three years and sort of lessons learned and things we tried and, and where we think we're going and stuff like that. Because honestly, when I started the foundation, um, I didn't know, I don't know how to run a nonprofit. I don't even run, know how to run a for profit. Um, uh, but I, I know I knew what the needs were. Uh, I didn't really know what my bandwidth was if it was my full-time gig. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we uh, expressed desires to do or tried to do. This is sort and of a 
and they're all things that we still definitely believe are things that should be done. Yeah, these are all great ideas. They're all good things. Uh, realistically, it's more like that right now. Um, so, you know, let's talk about the things we tried. I mean, so like, you know, to, this, to this day, actually, if you go to the Patreon, it says Video Game History Foundation is creating a digital library. And that's kind of true. Um, the issue with that is that it's just such a long-term goal that requires a lot of labor. Like, it requires uh, more than my volunteer tech team can realistically do to, to sort of solve that problem. Uh, in addition, not just technically, but also from a legal perspective, it's like, well, what is access to like game code look like so we're it's not that we gave up on that it's more like let's put that on the back burner and do the easier version first which is focus on more of a physical uh, location um, do you want to talk about digitizing and dumping and why we had to stop that? Well, yeah, sure. One of the first things that we talked about, um, and you even mentioned this already, is that we needed to have, you know, instead of it being this guy, Frank, yeah. it needed to be something that the industry could come to and trust. Uh, something that they'd be like, okay, this is a nonprofit. They're not going to just, you know, put our stuff out there and let the pirates at it and let all of the, you know, let everyone duplicate our games or whatever their fears are, right? Um, so one of the first things we talked about is like, hey, if we're going to be trying to play nice with all these companies, we have to convince them that we're serious and we're not going to let you know, their precious code and their precious IP and stuff fall into the wrong hands. Yeah, and it's yeah. I, I can see Jason Scott giving a thumbs down over there. Jason, we we need a Jason Scott to exist. We need a Jason Scott to exist. We need a traditional <laughs> library slash museum to exist, but there needs to be a gap in the middle that is filled, and that's kind of uh, the hole that we identified as like the place we could do the most uh, damage or good. <laughs> um, consulting for museums and libraries. I don't really even remember what I had in mind for that. Turns out they're all really smart and they don't need us. Yeah, and, uh, I mean we had we have some notion of like you know when people bring things to us and we go we're not a museum. Here's where you should bring it. Um, right if or some sort of like you know, something you want us to show the public about it, like maybe we can talk about that, but in general that just kind of turned into like a very easy, I don't think it's worth mentioning that much that when people approach us with, would you like this really expensive or rare thing? Yeah, we go no. We go but they put do. it at the strong or at, you know, something along those lines. Um, the idea of research grants, we actually, um, I still like this idea, which is that um, what we're out to prove to the world is that if people have the tools, they can tell really good stories. Um, uh, so we actually raised a little bit of extra money that we earmarked specifically uh, for grants for basically writing articles or doing videos or whatever, uh, interpreting uh, contemporary video game artifacts. And we published some amazing stuff. Um, the problem with that was that, uh, you know, a staff of one full-time volunteer, I didn't even mention this yet, like we're not paid, like we don't have enough revenue to gain salaries yet. I've been a volunteer for this thing for three years. Um, it, it just with one full-time volunteer and one part-time volunteer, it's just not like actually running a website with content and, and laying out articles and stuff. It was just such a distraction uh, that I had to walk away from that. Um, Establishing archival standards for game companies, like someone's got to do that. Uh, we're, we just don't have the bandwidth for that right now. Uh, and we've discovered that thankfully there are actually some efforts going on kind of internally at companies figuring that stuff out and they're going to be a lot better at knowing what the needs are for themselves. They're going to be really good at saving stuff for five years and then losing it. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> um, so advocate for preservation, it turns out, was like, the, the key, I think, but we'll get into that a little bit later, I think. Um, and then uh, teaching people how to be historians. We, we, we were sort of teaching people how to go access things. That's sort of related to the writing. Yeah, story, we had one uh, article up about that, and I still think it's a good... It's actually, a good article. There was, there was a panel or a roundtable earlier today about that. Yeah, being a video game historian. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, let other people do that. We've got other stuff to do. And then saving stuff on site, we still do that, which is like, company goes down, we show up with a van, basically. Um, so, um, with Kelsey on board, with the staff doubled, it's like, okay, let's just kind of start over, right? Like, let's, let's, um, we tried all these things, we know what works, we don't, we know it don't, doesn't work, let's, let's kind of start from square one. Um, and square one is basically what, asking what does it mean to preserve a game? Um, Video games, the way we think about, about them, a lot of times look like this, right? Um, so to preserve a game, do we do this? Do we go buy all the games and make sure that uh, at any moment that a researcher can come play the original game? Um, 
But what about on all original the, hardware? Yeah. So if we, do we need to be maintaining all the hardware? Um, all the hardware, right? Do we do we need to have like like all the, the cabinets and stuff? Um, what about digital and indie games? Andrew Borman gave a talk literally about this uh, two days ago. Like, do we need to be like downloading and buying every game ever made and just storing it just in case? Um, so let's, let's just say, in theory, we did that. Like, yay, we got all the games, right? Like, well, okay, now what, right? So. This is your slide, I'm gonna let yeah, you Yeah, so even if we have every single game, we have that warehouse full of arcades and everything, there's only so much you can get from a game if you're studying it and trying to tell the story about it. So I don't know if you guys have seen Chris Kohler's Complete and Box series on Kotaku, it's very good. Um, you can get from a game, you can get what, you know, how it was played, what it looked like, and what it sounded like, and if you're, if you're good at it, you can get all the way to the end. I mean, if you're not very good at it, maybe you won't even see the whole game. Um, if you have the box and the manual, you get a little bit more, you get maybe be some of the kind of marketing that they were going yeah, for. Yeah, you can start extrapolating star. like how you what they wanted your first impression to be, like like what it would have looked like in a store that would have attracted the buyer, right? Right. Like, but Is that, that a story? Yeah. Is you're, that enough? You're scraping for scraps, right? So it's basically for this reason that the Video Game History Foundation, we don't collect video games mostly. Um, <laughs> so we, we have a library, we have an archive of stuff, but you know, we, we have a lot of reasons that we don't bother with games. Um, primarily, to, to my eyes, it's like historians in the room, I know you're here, you know how to use emulators, right? Come on. <laughs> like, you, know, you know where the secret ROM sites are, and if you don't, talk to me later. Um, and, uh, and even the physical stuff, like the complete and box stuff, it's like a lot of that stuff's getting scanned by scanning groups, which is great, but even then, it's like it turns out video games are super popular and people are nostalgic for them and they collect them. So especially things like console games, like I'm not worried about like, you know, a Sega Genesis game disappearing. You know, like we, you name a game, well, between the two of us, it's like I know a guy who has that, you know. Um, and then, you know, I think most importantly, like, we're, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. The library's already doing this, um, such as the Strong Museum uh, in this photo where, they're, uh, where Shannon and JP are definitely just studying that game, like, super hard. That's not... Um, <laughs> uh, Shannon and JP aren't here at the show. Andrew is. Andrew wasn't there at the time, but he's... <laughs> uh, um, so, again, what does it mean to preserve a game? Um, Kelsey, you so want to yeah, we think it kind of falls into two basic categories. It's how the game was made and how the game was played, and we can go into both of those a little bit. Um, how it was made has a lot to do with, uh, I think that's on the next slide, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's things like the source code, like the original art, like the documentation, uh, prototypes and betas, it's all of these things that come out of uh, the making of a game at a company. Yeah, let's just go get those. Let's just get those. That's easy. Oh wait, there might be some problems with just getting with those. With getting to the next slide. Apparently. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> whoa, whoa, hey. All right, well, first of all, it's pretty much all okay. a trade secret. Um, these guys don't actually want you to have any of this stuff. Um, it's maybe in their archives, maybe they have some. It's not. <laughs> they maybe have their source code, they probably don't. They probably maybe have some original art, like that kind of thing tends to go in a drawer somewhere. Um, but more than likely it was trashed years ago. And uh, even modern developers who like think about these things, now that we have this secondary market of like, you know, remasters and stuff, and there's actually a reason to save this stuff, they still lose it all the time. Or if they, yeah, they just... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Konami has lost source code, and um, and it's you know it's not like people don't care. Well, there was a talk about this this year as well. I mean, actually, that was the same talk with, with, that Andrew had about preserving indie games. It's like, you know, actually archiving your stuff after you're done. If you're actually done, you know, like it's, it's not what you want to do. So a lot of that stuff just kind of deteriorates and and uh, goes away. Um, so this is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to let you take this one again because you just wrote this amazing headline to this slide. That <laughs> sure, I just so, want it on a t-shirt or something. So what we're trying to do is stop the bleeding of all of this stuff going away and fix the future so that it, you know, in the future it's not so much of a everything goes in the trash and we've lost everything and oops. So we're saving what still exists. We're going out and trying to find this stuff. We're cleaning out offices. We're accepting donations. No questions asked. Um, we have a secure way of... <laughs> 
<laughs> sending us things. If, you know. We have a place even we don't look at. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it there. And it's one of those, like, we'll figure it out later type. So yeah, we, we have a magic time capsule. Yeah. But. <laughs> um, and then advocating for a better future. So we want to equip li libraries with the tools to handle uh, game development material. We've been working with the uh, University of Washington, and some of the people in this audience actually are involved with that, um, in trying to kind of establish standards for in taking that stuff and uh, how to categorize it and how to put it into their systems. Um, we're publishing the results of video game source research. There's a really good one that we'll talk about in just a second. And of course, advocating for the commercial industry to join in on the discussion. Yeah, so I mean, uh, again, the idea is that, hey, if historians can actually you know, get inside the game and have the actual, like all the things, right? If, if there's an archive that's like a, like a good film archive, right, would have the scripts, might have some of the like rough cuts of the movie, might have some of the production photos and behind the scenes stuff like that. We don't have that uh, for very many games and what we're trying to prove out is like if we did, then it's not like scary for you video game company. It's not like people are like gonna clone your old ass game and, and you know, steal your trade secrets. Like no, they're celebrating it. Right, they can make you more money yeah by celebrating your stuff and you know teaching people about it and also possibly creating another entire product based on it yeah so I'm very proud of uh, having <laughs> proven this out like like crazy because um, we uh, acquired uh, the source code for Disney's Aladdin on the Sega Genesis it was um, just kind of in a box of developer stuff that was given to us it was you know not given to us like by the Walt Disney Corporation or whatever it's like someone kind of had it um, and so what we did with it, um, I didn't want to just put it on the internet because uh, Disney was selling that game on GOG, so that was a little too hot for me. Um, but what we did was we took that source code and I gave it to one of our volunteers, Rich Whitehouse, who uh, just kind of went through it and wrote this really detailed article breaking it down and like restoring cut content and explaining how the tools worked and, and uh, going through the design documents that were in there and explaining what the intent was and how the final came out and stuff. And it was a really great thing. Uh, I got slash dotted, which is still a thing in the year 2019. Um, and the, the direct result of that happening is that uh, that source code from our archive was used in a commercial re release of Disney's Latin on Sega Mega Drive. I mean, on the, on the sorry, on the Switch uh, and uh, PS4 and Xbox One, I think. Um, and this is kind of the video game equivalent of Disney going to the Library of Congress where they have all the film nitrates and saying, hey, do you have the original film nitrates? We're going to re-release uh, Beauty and the Beast or whatever. Right, right which, happens. which like, happens. Like, we have that in movies. We don't have that in games like the, like games don't games don't have a library of congress path where they donate the masters and if they need it they retrieve it later they just throw the masters in the trash um not on purpose usually um so that's that, that's sort of like you know how games were were made is is we we sort of again collect development material source code you know concept work things like that but again the other half is is how games were played yeah and and you know, there's a lot of things that go into that, and I think the next slide explains it all. Um, we've got discussions about it online. We've got criticism through both, you know, actual media sites and also probably just like internet forums and stuff. We've got these fan communities probably making content about all of these games, creating, you know, whether it's fan fiction or just talking about it or um, art, whatever. There's speculation. There's rumors. All of these things are part of the story of how the game was played. Um, the marketing plays into it. How did the game companies want you to see this game? The PR, how were they trying to sell the journalists on covering these games? And is it possible to capture all of this for every single game? Because as we were showing in the beginning, there's a whole lot of freaking games out there. Is it possible with one and a half volunteers to get all of that? <laughs> um, the answer is no, but um, what, we, what we sort of decided on was, well, if we kind of double down on the video game media, it at least captures a snapshot of a little bit of all of those pieces. So, um, so we um, mostly based on my having, you know, collected video game magazines myself as a journalist. Um, just we we started building a library. Um, and uh, so we, again, kind of doubled down on that and it's like, well, let's just try to like actually complete all the sets, fill all the holes, get all the really obscure stuff, just get the, 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 the biggest uh, capture we can of the video game media. Right now what that means for us is, is print because it's just, it's a lot easier for us right now to take a printed thing and put it on a shelf than um, figure out how to like, you know, back up the databases for like Nintendo age or whatever. Um, 
but um, yeah, so like we, like we we focus on that stuff, um, and uh, yeah. So that's you know again like like to us like if we, if we if we're capturing how they were made and how they were played, that to us is capturing that game. Um, but again, uh, right now people are bad video game historians. And we'll show you. Not some. all of you. Not yet. <laughs> In general, the tools out there are not so good. And so you get things like this. <laughs> Do you guys see this Jeopardy thing? Yeah. I can't believe this. They, they put that out there. Yeah, that was on Jeopardy. So Jeopardy. That was on actual Jeopardy. Yeah. So That's not just their Twitter. Yeah, that was like a Twitter meme thing that went around, and Jeopardy picked it up as an actual thing. Uh, what else? Oh, Ready Player One has this thing about the very, very first video game Easter egg that went as far as being like this, like goofy ass scene in the Spielberg movie. Right, and it wasn't even true when the book was written, right. let alone when yeah, the movie We knew came out. when the book was written, it wasn't the first Easter egg. Yeah. Uh, you love this one. Oh yeah, this is my, my least favorite uh, fun fact here. Did you know gaming likes to talk about uh, Gunpei Okoi being a janitor at Nintendo? And he was, he graduated with a degree in electronic engineering. He was not a janitor there. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone loves to talk about how the worst game ever made was E.T. and how it destroyed, it destroyed the entire the industry. Whole industry yeah. Yeah. Let's make a documentary about it. Um, <laughs> E.T. wasn't even like the worst reviewed game that month. If you if you were able to like look up, you know the the actual uh, media from the time. Uh, you know, granted, you know they, they, there was a lot of PR that from Atari that might have affected that. Um, sure. But you know, it's it, it, again, it's it's like th these these things happen, and people are video game bad, are bad video game historians. But we don't think it's their fault. We just think that there aren't really like that many uh, tools available. Uh, yeah, so let's try to find this uh, review of E.T. Right. Like, even, <laughs> even if you knew to find that review of E.T., it's like, okay, well, let's go to the library, right? Um, there are two libraries in the country. One of them should look very familiar. Uh, the other one's Michigan State. If you go to Michigan State, they have exactly two issues of that magazine that reviewed E.T. So it's like, you, you can't just go to a library. Uh, and study this stuff. Uh, a lot of the stuff is scanned, uh, not all of it. There's a lot of holes. Um, I don't know, I, if I were guessing at a percentage, it'd be, you know, maybe 40 to 50 percent of like the American magazines that, that actually reviewed video games that you can easily find. Uh, the Internet Archive, thankfully, has mirrored a lot of these scans and, and made them text searchable, which is great, but uh, we don't have complete coverage right now. Um, and uh, while we, you know, we, and we do have a lot of these physical magazines, but the, the idea of scanning everything in this library is just a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and that's just the magazines themselves. Uh, um, so what, what we actually went kind of the next step uh, from there and started uh, collecting the things that actually made up the magazines. Uh, so if magazines are these time capsules of how people played and discussed games, uh, then the pieces that made the magazines to us would take you one level deeper. So on the right was actually the uh, archive of GamePro magazine. I don't know if anyone read GamePro. Uh, so these are uh, their raw layout files. We got Quark Express files going back to 1993 um, with fonts I literally can't find on the internet, so that's fun. Um, and we actually have a lot of the art that was sent to them uh, by game publishers. Um, when I worked in the media, I took a lot of that stuff home myself uh, when I was at oneup.com. Um, it was kind of after EGM magazine got shut down, and it was a really interesting time to work in this office because we had the entire fifth floor, but like all the magazines were gone, and so we were just in the corner, and the rest of it was like Fallout 3. You know, you just kind of like scrounge the wastelands and find video game press releases and drawers and stuff. Um, but I, I, I basically liberated all that stuff from the trash, so we still have that. Um, and we uh, worked with Game Informer magazine uh, last year in, in May uh, and helped them sort of start digitizing their tremendous back catalog of the kind of press material uh, that was sent to them so that you get a better understanding of like how that material got into the magazine as well. And you understand like, you know, the build of the game that the reviewer was playing when they reviewed the game. So you, like when they say something weird that doesn't make sense, maybe you can cross-reference that game and be like, oh, that's why they said that. Um, so right now, the tools suck. We realize that, and we want to make it easier. So we pose for pictures just like the strong does, <laughs> pretending to work. <laughs> Got a stack of PC Gamer there. I'm really proud of that poster in the background. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can you see the mug? No. No, the mug's not there. Um, so this is kind of where we are right now. Um, uh, we'll kind of go around and, and, and talk about what, what all the things are, are that we're showing. Um, on the upper left, like we're, we're pretty good at digitizing in mass when it comes to it. So this is part of that Game Informer project. Um, we digitized uh, literally thousands of their uh, press discs, so things like press kits and screenshots, artwork, uh, trailers, stuff like that. Like the art that was sent for the covers, things like that. We uh, did all kinds of other media too. There was paper, there was yeah. zip disks, there was uh, floppies and um, I don't know, dat tapes, all kinds of fun. So we don't, the, what we identified pretty early was like we don't want to be, you know, the organization that like if, you know, Joe Average on the streets like, hey, I have this sort of rare cartridge. We don't want to like, you know, like record scratch stop everything and be like, oh my God, we'll digitize that. It's like, well, other people have that skill set. We'll pass you along. But in weird cases like this, where there's like a company in the industry that needs things to be done a little bit more delicately and, and, and not necessarily, they don't want it blasted on the internet, but they want it safe and we'll figure it out later. Uh, hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> like we can respond to that sort of thing. Um, we uh, we did manage to build a library this year. It's a, it's a it's a very, very small library that's also my office, um, but it exists and we have um, most of the U.S. publications that review video game magazines and, and uh, have expanded a little bit internationally as well. Um, something we don't talk about too often is that we actually contribute curated museum displays uh, to uh, game shows, specifically this one's Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Um, this is... Uh, point of contention within the foundation about whether we should be spending time doing this, but it's, it's, it's a cool thing we do to sort of, again, show the work, right, and be like, well, if we have all of this material, we can tell stories, uh, not just in articles, but in, like, curated museum displays and things like that. Um, we do industry advocacy, and we get out there and, and, and uh, like, this is a talk I gave at GDC last year um, about uh, uh, video game preservation and, and, and how we move forward industry-wise and how we should be working together a little bit more. And then the, the bottom right is the, uh, the showing up with a van scenario that I, that I talked about earlier. That's um, specifically, that was IDOS US. We had, a, we had about, um, I think, eight hours notice that, that it was the last day that, of their lease on <laughs> <laughs> their, their former U.S. headquarters, and they're like, "Hey, we're gonna throw all this stuff out unless you come right now." So, we 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 can do that. We did that with Telltale Games as well. So we actually managed to rescue a lot of Telltale's uh, assets um, because we're in the Bay Area, and uh, it's literally my job. So, hit me up. Uh, and I'm in Seattle, so the other part of yeah. the game industry, yeah. we're <laughs> we're fairly well covered. But what about the future? What about water cars? <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot about, I made this slide like an hour ago. Um, so that's where we are now, but kind of where are we going, right? Um, what are your thoughts, Kelsey? Where are we going? Well, I think that for the next year, I think we're still kind of hitting this advocacy track and trying to make it a little bit more solid, um, trying to form some actual partnerships, which are things that are slowly but surely happening. We've had some very good conversations with some companies that might surprise you. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you would probably not be surprised to learn that like an indie company is like, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're small. We don't care about, we don't have lawyers. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, the people are starting to listen, and that's a really good thing, and I think we need to kind of, once, I think it's a domino effect. I think once you get one or two people really on board, and the Disney one was a very, very good step in that direction, um, you know, not that they're, it's still Disney, they're not like, here's all the source code. Uh, but once you start kind of legitimizing that, then I think the dominoes start to fall and this gets easier. Yeah, and, and really the ultimate goal for us is that it's like, we, we want source code to be studyable. And when I say source code, I should, I should, I should, I should redline that source assets, source source material. We want we want video game development source material like to be in archives, in libraries, and collections, and for that not to be weird and scary for the video game industry. Right, because it's not scary for things like movies. I mean, uh, movie makers don't care if the script is studyable later. Movie makers don't care if you can see props or talk to the actors or whatever about it. But video game companies are very different. They're very closely guarded, and they don't want you to see behind the curtain. Um, and you know. That we're losing a lot of really great stories and, and interesting things, and also we're losing like forward progress by not allowing people to study that stuff. So again, I think that's at least as of this moment, and I mean this this company of ours is you know it's amorphous on, on, on 
purpose, right? I want us to sort of evolve with the times. Where, where our heads are at right now is like occupying that space, right? Like I, I like to say that the 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 skill that Kelsey and I both have that I that. Um, you know, if anything, like the, the biggest skill we have is just if making. If we have a skill, if we have a skill, we <laughs> probably have no skills. But if we had one, I think it's I think it's just making connections. It's bridging people. It's bridging communities and companies and and technologies. And it's 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 sort of like making uh, the industry less afraid of people looking at their stuff and uh, maybe making the sort of like what's the antithesis of companies like the the sort of like rogue pirates like I was you know back in the day like like hacking these games apart and reverse engineering them and stuff and and, and distributing ROMs online etc like like making make putting those two things a little closer together I think is something that um, that, that we can possibly affect in the world. Uh, so that's sort of why we uh, focus so much on the industry advocacy part of it. We, we call it poking the bear, right? Like the Aladdin article where we had the source code that we weren't supposed to have. Like analyzing that and showing it off and showing you Disney's dirty little secret that they cut this like prisoner enemy from the that level, you know, like like uh, to us that's just poking the bear and being like, look, guys, it's not that bad, right? It, it doesn't hurt that much when you get poked. Um, another example of this was um, we managed to recover a, a version of SimCity for the original NES, the 8-bit NES, um, which Nintendo was working on before they'd done the 16-bit version. And I think I think the typical like. If you're in the sort of like communities that I've been in my whole adult life of, of people who like track down these like rare prototype games and stuff, you know, I, and, and you mentioned something like that, it's like, oh, you know, Nintendo's lawyers are going to come down on you, man. You can't do that. Like, but it's no, it's like, it's just a little poke, right? Like, we're like, we, we're like look, look, we're going to celebrate this artifact and break it down and tell you why it's really interesting and we're going to blare it loudly. And, uh, you know, it's like, I'm not in jail. Are you in jail? You're not in jail, so we're fine. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and the Nintendo lawyer troops didn't like come raining down on us or whatever. Um, and so I think it's it's a little bit more of that poking the bear and, and continuing the conversations we've had, which by the way have happened because of the poking. Uh, so I think really our future lies uh, mostly in that right now, and then continuing to sort of build up this. Uh, we're also in what I call like the, the the hunting and gathering phase, I guess, of like like video game archiving, where it's like go find the things that we know are important and just like put them somewhere, and we'll figure it out later, um, or even help other institutions to do that. It's just stop the bleeding and fix the future. That's right. <laughs> um, that's all we had, actually. Nice. We did that. Um, We're good. So I assume no one has like any questions, right? Like we've solved everything. <laughs> we so. solved it all. We fixed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have actually quite a bit of time for questions. So uh, let's get to it. We got 23 minutes. Um, do we have? We don't have a mic out there, right? Is okay. That not a mic out there. <laughs> do people want to come up and talk into the mic? That's know. fine. Or shout. We'll figure it out. Uh, yes, you with the green shirt. Uh, the question was, are there efforts for preserving web-based software? There are. Uh, Jason, if you're still in the room, can probably talk to you about what Archive Team is, is doing for that sort of thing. Uh, I'm aware of a lot of uh, projects for preserving like Flash-based games, which is probably what you had in mind. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where, like, I would love to be able to do that. You know, I'd love to just like have a million projects like that and, and organize people. Uh, I don't think that's either of our skills right now. I think organizing people at some point becomes a thing. Yeah. That we it, right now. I mean, anytime we say we don't do something, it's almost always just because we're only two people. Yeah. Um, it's just not where we're at yet. So yeah, there are efforts. Uh, to do that, uh, I'm not like intimately familiar with them, but uh, you know, if you want to hang out after the panel, if Jason's still around as well, uh, he can probably talk to you about those efforts. Uh, so, blue T-shirt, yes. Uh, when you say there's any particular uh, designation for holy grail that you would want to find, so I, the I, question I, is, uh, do we have a holy grail as historians? And this was asked in our Discord the other day, and you didn't answer it, and neither did I. So oh, really? okay, let's answer it now. We're spot. saving it. <laughs> Um, to me, a good holy grail um, would be, 
I, I don't think it's crazy to say that the 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 mother series from Nintendo is really important to uh, to us culturally as as people who play games. The Earthbound series. Um, and a lot of fans of that series know that Mother 3, the final entry in the series, um, started life um, on the Nintendo 64 before, uh, before basically, like, they, they worked on it for like four years and it just wasn't coming together and they kind of had to just put a stop to it and move on. Um, the Game Boy Advance game shares a lot of what we saw in, in that 64 game, but um, to me, like Mother 3 is, is a really important, impactful game and, and, being, and, and they got far enough to where most, at least half I think is what I heard of, of, of the original uh, vision of that game was actually playable. Um, they actually like developed it chronologically so you could play you know up to a certain point and then it would just stop is where it left off um, there's even there's this um, there's this interview not interview it was a roundtable discussion when they canceled mother 3 on the 64 and it was between Shigeru Miyamoto and uh, Iwata and Itoi um, about you know it was, it was basically like they sat down and, and had a candid conversation for the fans about why the game stopped and and Miyamoto says this thing I don't know how serious he was when he said this but he he said that they were considering um, even though they just canceled the game, they were considering putting it out at their Space World show anyway, just so like fans could like say goodbye to it. Um, that to me tells me there's a lot to study there. So like for me, that's that's a holy grail. Is is some wh whatever was left of that original vision of of Mother Three would be my holy grail. I'm just gonna go a little broader and say really, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of Nintendo in terms of the uh, way games are made. Um, like we know that they do pitch documents and the same things that other game companies do because they'll occasionally show you a glimpse of it at like a GDC talk or something. Right. We know there's tons of that somewhere and we're probably never going to get to see it. So the Holy Grail is just like all of that. It's, it's Nintendo stuff, it's I Nintendo. guess. Because yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, what company is more... And that's something I struggle with internally a lot is just like, you know, you almost have to find that balance between like we don't want to lose this obscure stuff because that obscure thing might be the key to everything you know, and we won't know it for 50 years versus that's our Disney. <laughs> you right. know, like we know people are going to study that company 50 years from now for sure. Um, so it's it's kind of a struggle of of, of, of resource management, I think. Um, I couldn't quite. I think the guy way in the back in the hat is the first one I saw. Uh, I took two parts. Uh, one, uh, Rough Stuff and Game Dungeon and uh, Previous Mind. I don't think I can hear you. I'm, uh, can you? I, I didn't hear the name. Yeah. I'm sorry. The, this microphone is hot. Does anyone want to pass that back? I think that, that one back? is too. And that one, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Who is it? Let's get standing here. Okay, you got to pass it to the next person, though. You cool with that? Fair enough. All right. All right it's a so, meta game. So uh, Ross Scott from uh, Game Dungeon and Freeman's Mind, he's been a big advocate of keeping games from being like lost and all that stuff. I was wondering if you're familiar at all with him. My second part is with uh, online DRM becoming more of a thing and making it harder for, for games to be like archived. I was wondering if you had any insight on that. Okay, so Ross from Game Dungeon is that? Uh, I can't say I'm familiar with Game Dungeon. Okay, so I will check that out for sure. And then the second question, if I heard right, was uh, online games, right? Like how we're, is, is that making things harder? Um, it is. Um, and that's a very complicated topic, is like how do you uh, preserve a game that uh, relies on online experiences? Uh, I think the way a lot of people think about that is like, oh, well, we'll, you know, in an ideal world, we'll, we'll take that server code, we might even take the original servers, we'll just keep that, like, world alive somewhere. Um, and that's preserving the game, you can visit the game, but if you tell me, like, you know, in 50 years, like, you can load up World of Warcraft and it's empty, like, the, to me, that's not preserving World of Warcraft. Right, you don't get the experience and the, the culture around it, and, you know, when we talk about the way games were played, like, that's not playing World of Warcraft if you're alone on that server. You're getting a lot out of it, but it's, it's, it's almost like we were talking about earlier with just, like, if you just have the box, it's right. like, you know, it's like, well, that's what those assets look like in World of Warcraft, that's what a quest was, but I'm not really getting like the rating experience with a party. Um, I think that um, I, 
I think that because we've had it so easy for so long where a video game is just this binary thing on a physical, tangible object that you just take out and it's like, that's the whole game. Uh, I think that we define video game preservation in a way that I don't think is sustainable uh, for for the games that are that are coming out uh, now even, right? Like, like games that even console games that have online experiences you know we we can't like capture all of that as a as a as a as a as an experience that can be replicated, um, so I think we need just need to start thinking about what that means in a different way. Um, there's a really great project at uh, Stanford University called Preserving Virtual Worlds um, that focuses a lot on like documenting. Right? It, it's it's almost like. You know, I, I think I almost think we need to think of it more as being like a, a nature photographer or something, right? Like we need to document what it was to have been in those communities, and and, and You and, made a really good analogy a while back um, about how we don't when we preserve like a game of baseball. No, I stole that one. Oh, you stole it. Okay, I stole that from J.P. Dyson at the Strong. Great. Museum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> J.P. made a really good quote a while back about how we don't preserve when we preserve a baseball game. We don't preserve like the people. We don't try to like recreate the whole game. Well, you I. I stole the notion and then I took it to that level. Okay. Where it's right. like, we don't clone the players. We don't rebuild Shea Stadium. Yeah. Right. So we have maybe some videos of the game. We have uh, like the newspaper, the box score, and like you know maybe the, some of the reactions to it in the newspaper and whatever you have. That's oral what you history, have. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe the way we need to start thinking about some games is that we're not going to be able to recreate them always. You got to think about what would an historian want, right? Like, what, like an historian trying to tell the story of that game, what would they want? And they want to know what it was like to play that game. And if we can't literally give them the game to play, we need to give them the next best thing, which is context about what it was to play that game. All right. Um, actually, I think the guy right next to you was the earliest one I saw last time. So with time going forward, and it's a few decades away, but uh, we're starting to get close to when games are going to start entering the public domain. <laughs> and I was curious if you thought that that'll make the experience easier or harder once uh, that starts rolling around. So the question was, once games are public domain, will that make um, the tools to research them easier or harder, right? Um, we'll all be dead by the time, like, literally any game we care about is in the public domain um, because of uh, the Walt Disney Corporation again. Um, uh, <laughs> they're good and bad. Um, most they're, they're terribly evil, actually. Um, but but um, I, I wouldn't depend on public domain solving anything. Like, I think. We, as a nation, have completely destroyed the idea of what public domain was supposed to be for. Uh, and by the time these works enter public domain, like literally everyone who played them will be dead. So, like, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, I guess theoretically, like, if EA wanted to, like, put all of their source code, you know, in, in, in like a museum and say, like, people can only access it when it's public domain, that, like, okay, well, at least. You know what I mean? They did that, but also, you know, people are going to be studying games that came out like a hundred years ago. You know, so um, and ownership's going to get a little complicated once we get to that. Yeah, and too. like public domain will probably cease to exist by that point, is my <laughs> guess, with the way things are going. Um, but uh, no, I don't think it makes things easier. And in fact, like the idea of waiting for something better to happen is is a really poisonous way of thinking about things because. Um, Researchers don't research stuff they don't care about already is kind of how it happens. I mean, we might occasionally discover something fascinating and go off on a different trail, but like really the, the things that researchers uh, put all, all their time and effort into are, are at least related to something that they were already like accustomed to and 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 uh, and, and knew and possibly even enjoyed, um, and and I don't think that's likely to happen a hundred years after the fact. So I don't I don't think public domain is really going to fix anything. Um, so I think you were, with, yeah, you on the right with the glasses. I think yeah. And then you'll be next in the blue shirt next year. Make things easier. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to try not to ramble. I apologize. You mentioned earlier a lot, you discovered a lot of your games through playing on emulators and things when you were younger. I just would love to kind of hear your perspective now that, you know, technology is advancing faster and faster. You have people on the one side saying, no, you're not getting the authentic experience unless you're playing on original hardware. 
composite PVM, and, you know, CRT TVs. You've got kind of the mid -step. The authentic PVM RGB monitors. Exactly. RGB monitor, SNES, yes. yes. one chip. Uh, um, you've got kind of the mid step <laughs> of like analog of like, let's replicate the hardware through today's technology. Yeah. And you've got emulation on one side. So kind of in your vision of like how the games are made, how the games are played, from a consumer side, what's your guys' kind of perspective on like, is, is it really experiencing the video game if you're playing it through emulation or is there have to be gotcha. some sort of like hardware bridge? I just love to hear kind of your guys' thoughts. I don't know if we have a company line on that, but, <laughs> but I think we can both respond from a personal perspective. Sure. Do you want to go first? Oh, I think, I mean, part of it is like, even if you have all of the hardware and everything, like you can, how far can you take that, right? Yeah. Like you can't bring back your childhood friends to all sit around Goldeneye at the same TV. Your mom's have, in the kitchen baking right, cookies or whatever. The, yeah. the pizza rolls in and stuff. I mean, how far back do you have to take it for it to be the authentic cultural experience of playing that game? And I think it's just kind of a dangerous path to start, like, requiring. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> I could speak very snarkily to that, but I won't. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I agree. And, and I, th I think that I think there's always going to be some need for, like, this is the controller it shipped with. You should know that the Intellivision was garbage, you know, like the, the control, <laughs> um, so that you understand why the games were designed the way they were. Um, I think that there is, um, I think the need for that is, is overblown. I think that's, you know, I, I am fine with a world where the only way to access an Intellivision controller is to make an appointment at the Strong Museum. You know, like, like, like it's like, it, only if you're like writing a book about the damn Intellivision should you need to touch that controller. Anyone who says otherwise is uh, just letting their nostalgia fuel what they think is important for preservation. Um, that's my personal perspective. Um, in terms of like emulation, and I, I think you were even touching on FPGA based uh, like hardware, I like to call it replication. Um, I, between, the, it's, I, I love both of them. I mean, like I've, I've, you know, obviously like emulations where I got my start, I've done commercial emulation work. Um, I love my FPGA consoles, man. They're so good. In fact, at the Bootleg Games Pajama Party at midnight tonight in whatever room that is, uh, we will be playing on two analog FPGA-based consoles. Um, I think um, I've really enjoyed seeing how FPGA... Do you, you guys know what we're talking about when we talk about FPGA? I've seen a couple thumbs up, but just very briefly, it's... Um, so software emulation is using a, a, like a, a computer chip, essentially, through software only to replicate all of the functions um, of, of a different computer, essentially. So, you know, uh, having an executable on your computer behave the way uh, Sega Genesis would, as opposed to FPGA, which is more hardware-based, which is actually, you know, physically altering uh, a chip in real time to function as that chip would. Um, you know, it's not necessarily more accurate, but it's lower overhead, and you can, and, and, and you can, um, you can you can you can get to that endpoint easier than than you might in software emulation and and I I love it and I've been uh, you know telling like museum folk for years now like even before the analog products it's like hey you should be pumping money into uh, FPGA replication of this game hardware because the people who care about this hardware are all getting real old and we should be working on this right now. And not to mention that, you know, the components are starting to die. You yeah, know, all like the components are starting yeah. to die on the consoles. Like, the con every, every console has a shelf life for sure, yeah. Um, does that answer? It does, answer? yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. So uh, next to you, actually, in the blue shirt was the next one. Okay, so this is kind of a two-parter and part of the first part I want to ask about is answered by emulation somewhat. Um, okay. So how are you looking at preserving, um, say like the Pizza Hut demo disc that came out for PlayStation that had yeah. five games on it and four of them became like top sellers. You had Metal Gear Solid, Gran Turismo, Tomb Raider 3, and yeah. uh, Tony, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on there. Um, and thinking about like these weird cross-promotional promo discs or promo carts that came out, um, and also, um, let's see, what was the other thing? Um, in addition, okay. in, hold on, um, yeah. so, <laughs> um, 
Also, there were like videotapes that were sent out in the late 90s. Yeah. Um, like I got a banjo kazooie tape in the mail. Yeah. And, and Nintendo that was, did like, a bunch of Donkey thing Kong Country. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know how those are being preserved. If yeah. Those are like on tape too. And then finally, so this is the last part. Three part. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's that, that's like. Oh, okay. Two parts those are related. The, all right. The all right. promo. Fair. Section. Sorry. I'll give you that. And then number three, you have some games that have this like weird history where they've been released, had a super low print count or like yeah. bad ratings or something like that. Nobody bought them. And then they were re-released. Some of them were re-reviewed in like magazines and stuff like that. I think Guitar Man was re-reviewed sure, and re-released. Yeah. It was weird going into GameStops and seeing like $70 Guitar Man's. And yeah, because there was a company that actually like put them back in print. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, it's actually a really quick answer to that, which is that if it's a video game you could have bought in a store, we don't care. Like other people are taking care of that stuff uh, easily because that's the kind of thing that you can, if it's something you can easily buy on eBay right now, we just assume someone else is taking care of it. And we, that includes demos and it includes yeah. uh, those VHSs and stuff and I actually think most of those are on the archive, yeah. uh, Internet Archive. Uh, there's there's groups like No Intro and Redump uh, that that are going through and, and for things like the Pizza Hut demo disc that you mentioned, you know, they're validating the data on that and and uh, throwing the CRC hash online so that we know exactly what that disc is and, and how to rip it correctly. Um, so uh, thank you. Five minutes left. Um, so we're not so worried about the retail discs or like the tapes that were sent to consumers um, because that's that's all easy pickings, right? Like, like that stuff is being taken care of. Almost all those tapes are on YouTube, if not the Internet Archive. Um, and uh, I wouldn't worry about those. So like that's why we focus on things that like you and I wouldn't have access to. So like the demos that maybe only the press got as opposed to, to people or things that were only at E3 or whatever. Um, I'm going to say uh, you in the back that was, yes, you with the double hands, yes. Feel free to shout because we only have five minutes if you, if, you, if you feel confident in your voice. Um, okay. So this is sort of the opposite of like a complete whale question. Um, in like television and stuff, there's, there's like um, things that are like known to be lost due to like poor archival practices in the past, like old BBC serials and stuff that have just disappeared in history because they like burned them for storage space or something like that. Is there something that you know like has been lost to history that is like going to create like a serious like permanent mm. gap in like video game preservation and it's like unrecoverable. At so the, the question since uh, he didn't have a mic at the beginning was uh, uh, is there something that we know for sure is absolutely lost that, that, that would have been uh, uh, substantial to historians, uh, much like um, I don't know that that Orson Welles f film follow-up, like his cut of that uh, to Citizen Kane. What was the name of that movie? I forgot. Anyway, did you have something? Uh, well, I, I think there was like a fire at EA at one point that we know. Killed. I don't know about oh, that. Oh, okay. This <laughs> actually, there's an article I read like several years ago, so the details are like. Oh, are you talking about Will Wright's stuff? Because he lost that in a fire. Maybe that is. Yeah. The Sims yeah. 2. Thank you. Yeah. Christy so Marx's papers burned. There have been literal fires. Yeah, the, the, the follow up to SimCity, I think, was lost in Will's fire, and, and his SimCity tools. Uh, were lost. Um, I, I, I saw Phil back there. Uh, I think the SimCity uh, follow-up that was like an ad for game, not ad for game, but it was like a serious training Sim, game. Sim Refinery. Yeah, for Exxon. <laughs> like, we think that's lost. I don't know if that's a holy grail, but... It is um, for Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's nothing that comes to mind for me that like I've definitely asked everyone who would have it, and they've all said, no, it's gone. Um, so that is a really good question, though. And we should have one of those because um, scaring the crap out of people is a really good fundraising mechanic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we should probably have one of those in our back pocket. So thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I got two minutes, so I'm going to say you uh, just raise your hands with the glasses. Yes, thumbs up. Yes. Yeah. Final question, this better be good. People are watching on Twitch. Uh, right, I was, I was just gonna ask, um, uh, what kind of games, like like maybe certain types of releases, certain type of consoles, do you, do you find 
hardest to like archive from your positions? Because I think of like um, like those old like pre-smartphone Java games that yeah. just come on phones. I just assume that there's very little information about those, mostly because no one gives a crap. Yeah. <laughs> um, I so uh, that's a really good example. Uh, just to repeat the question quickly, is like what what maybe platform of games or, or grouping of games is is the hardest to. Uh, to archive, and I'm, I'm going to ignore the idea of games with online experiences, modern stuff, you know, the thousands of iPhone games or whatever that are coming out all the time. And, and I'm actually going to agree with you that I'm really concerned about uh, the Java games um, because there's a, there's a really good known quantity in, in early smart, not smartphone, pre-smartphone games, uh, there's, there's a good known quantity of like, oh, the company that you know worked on this, or like, oh, this is like a Mega Man game that is actually lost. Like, they're almost all terrible, but it's like that is a snapshot of what was being made in that time, and there's a lot of examples of like, you know, pixel artists that you probably loved in like the 16-bit era that kept making good pixel art that you might also love in the cell phone era that is probably literally gone now. Um, and you're touching on it a little bit, but it's probably much worse in Japan. Yeah. Um, you know, the Capcom made a bunch of cell phone games. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's stuff that would be very significant to a historian studying, you know, the history of Mega Man or whatever that, yeah, it's pretty much non-existent now? Uh, like in a lot of cases, the pirates were our saviors here. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the people who were actually like pirating those those jar files uh, and distributing on them on the internet, it's like, that's the only record we have of most uh, uh, Java games. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, sorry to, to answer your question with your example, but like that is the one that I, I kind of think about the most if we completely ignore uh, games with online experiences. Uh, don't make me do my Farmville rant. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately for questions, but thank you all for coming. Thank you all on Twitch for watching. <laughs> Bootleg game pajama party in five hours. Please bring your pajamas. Um, and uh, thank you again.